Welcome to the Media CFO Podcast, the show where we talk to people on the front lines of finance, business affairs, legal and strategy in the media and entertainment industry. I'm your host, Tobias Jäger, and when I'm not hosting this podcast, I'm the CFO of television and content studio Colibri Studios in London. Today, we're joined by Claire Hungate, former CEO of London-based social content studio Brave Bison. Claire started her career more than 20 years ago as a barrister in BBC's in-house legal department. Since then, she has been in the entertainment industry in various legal and business affairs roles in production companies like Princess Productions, Wall to Wall Media, and subsequently as Chief Operating Officer at AIM listed Shed Media Group. In that role, Claire was instrumental in taking the company private in a management buyout backed by Warner Brothers, and she became the CEO once the MBO was completed. Claire just recently completed another milestone in her career as CEO of AIM listed Brave Bison, and she is ready to take on the next big thing. Claire, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, and I'm really looking forward to chatting to you because obviously you're a veteran of the industry. Does that and mean old? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Experienced. Um, <laughs> and um, when, um, when I got to know you, what I found fascinating was that I think you're one of the few people that have seen the industry from almost every angle, maybe except for talent, I don't know. Um, but you've seen it from legal perspective, from a CEO perspective, from someone who has to run the organization. Um, and before we dive into that, I would love to talk to you about kind of your journey, how you got there, how you got started in the business. What was your first kind of entertainment job? Uh, I, I left college during a recession and actually went into retail, which was great fun when you're 21 <laughs> years old i moved to london and i worked for a record store called our price wow. which doesn't exist anymore mm. i think it was bought by wh mm. smith and then they <laughs> got rid of it um so that was fun and then i went to work for waterstones mm -hmm. um so i worked at a couple of waterstones and you know it's lovely being that age and having no responsibilities <laughs> and living in london your only responsibility is to close the bookshop at night no um and you made great friends and had lots of fun um, and I then started running the bookshop at the Institute of Contemporary Arts mm -hmm. on the Mall, um, where I became very, very interested in contemporary art, um, both live art um, and uh, contemporary art. Um, and while I was there, one of my colleagues uh, set up a digital arts center mm -hmm. which was backed by Toshiba wow, nice. um, and we began working uh, with Harbottle and Lewis mm -hmm. to kind of put together the deal around this this digital arts hub and you know the deal around it the sponsorship around it the rights angles around it um, and I became quite fascinated with the law and IP law um, and decided to go and qualify as a lawyer so was, was that something you had studied? You mentioned college. Uh, no, I um, I studied uh, literature with film studies at oh Warwick. Okay. Yeah. Um, while I was at the ICA, I studied and I did an MA in critical and cultural theory. Wow. Um, so I was, you know, big into semiotics and all that kind of stuff, which in later life I realized was completely irrelevant. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a great luxury to have done earlier yeah. in life, but yeah. then... Later in life, those kind of things become less important and you yeah. realize there are other other priorities in life than talking <laughs> about semiotics and philosophy and yeah. the meaning of things. You um, discovered they weren't hiring at the philosophy company. Uh. Exactly. It didn't, <laughs> didn't pay enough at the semiotics company, so I moved on from that. Um, but I, I went to study law. So mm -hmm. I uh, in the UK, you can, if you've got a, a three-year um, BA or, or BSc, you can go and do a one-year conversion course, mm -hmm. which is called the CPE. Um, so you do a one-year legal conversion course. And then I decided that I wanted to be uh, a barrister. You then decide whether you want to be a mm -hmm. solicitor or a barrister. Um, I decided I wanted to be a barrister because that was the quicker route. Yeah. Um, as a barrister, you had to do a one-year pupillage. Um, and as a solicitor, you had to do two years mm -hmm. articles. Uh, so I was, you know, a slightly maturer student by yeah. that time because lots of people on that course <laughs> were um, had just come out of college. No. So I just wanted the quickest route to as much money as possible, no. as quickly as possible. Uh, so I decided I wanted to be a barrister rather than a solicitor. It was a it was a quicker route to finishing. So I had to do my one year conversion course. Then you had to do one year to train as a barrister. 
and then one year pupillage. Um, I did half my, I'd always had an interest in the arts and in entertainment. So I pushed and pushed and pushed to do um, six months of my pupillage in house. Mm -hmm. um, at, what's, a, what's a pupillage? Uh, pupillage is, is, is like articles. So solicitors mm -hmm. do articles um, and barristers do pupillage. So it's, it's your on the job training. Mm -hmm. Um, so I did uh, some of that in a chambers. So barristers work in chambers. Mm -hmm. And then I hassled and hassled and hassled at the BBC um, <laughs> to get half my pupillage in-house, which, mm -hmm. you, which you could do. And so I persuaded uh, a guy called Ricky Nath, who was then director of legal at BBC Resources. Mm -hmm. uh, so the BBC used to be divided up into, uh, I think it was... BBC Public Service, BBC Resources, BBC R&D. So okay. BBC Resources mm -hmm. became part of BBC Worldwide, I, I think. Um, but it was the commercial arm of the BBC in those days. Yeah. So Ricky was the director of legal, and I persuaded him to take me on for a pupillage. He couldn't pay me. In mm. those days, you didn't have to. So mm. now you have to pay someone if they're doing a pupillage. <laughs> you have to pay them. Um, so I was unpaid um, for six months. Wow. Very grateful to my brother for letting me live in his <laughs> apartment in London during that time. That's what um, family's for, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I kept telling him. Um, I'm very grateful to Ricky for giving me that opportunity. You know, he mm. really put me through my... Uh, put me through a kind of trial number of you know, different interviews and questions and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I did my six months pupillage there. Really, really enjoyed it. Um, and then moved on and went straight into working in independent TV production. Mm. Would you say that the, the pupillage, that was the kind of the place where you learned the business, how it all works or um, kind of dove into you know more the mechanics of that industry so i learned quite early on that as a lawyer my skills lay in deal making mm -hmm. and uh, you know commerciality you know i don't believe you can teach that yeah. i believe people either have an instinct for that or they don't mm. and you know i've spent so much time in my career interviewing business affairs people which is what we you know tend to call lawyers in in tv production yeah. as you know um and you cannot learn the instinct for mm. deal making you just have it or you don't and i realized quite early on that i wasn't great with detail and i wasn't very patient <laughs> and so you know as a lawyer that you would pay money to yeah. um you know i'm i'm slightly unfair to myself but i was much better in-house in a business affairs role which later became kind of more of a managerial role um, and i was very very lucky at the bbc because ricky had a very very kind of hands-off attitude mm -hmm. um, he told me later he was always watching what i was doing or always had someone watching what i was doing mm -hmm. but he gave me a great level of independence mm -hmm. um, you know i remember the first big contract i did was for the eurovision song contest wow um, and for some reason, the BBC owned the scoreboard and we were lending it out. I can't remember to who to, wow. maybe to Norway. And so I had to do the contract <laughs> to, for, to, for the provision of the Eurovision Song Contest scoreboard <laughs> uh, to the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation or, you know, whoever it was. I can't re exactly remember. Um, and that was quite terrifying. But of yeah. course, no one ever looks at a contract again until unless something goes wrong yeah um uh but you know i did that with ricky pretty pretty hands off yeah. working with the commercial teams within the bbc um and you just learn very quickly um and in business affairs a lot of what you are doing isn't about your knowledge of the law and what you learn from a textbook it's what you know about the market the value of what you have the value of what someone else has, how much they want what you have, you know, yeah. it's market forces, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and putting together, a, you know, a, a deal and then, you know, a, a, a contract from there. So, um, you know, not much of what you do in business affairs in TV production can be learned from textbooks. Yeah. It's from experience. It's, you know, from knowledge. It's from instinct. So when when did you feel that kind of change or shift happened in you because you described uh, like your studies 
that that's that was all very creative uh and and artsy and then the institute when when did you feel like oh hold on there's a i don't know maybe other side to you or did did you feel like you changed to become the creative deal maker or how how was that process for you because it feels like you went from art to then you know legal profession is usually perceived as quite dry and technical uh, but you talk about it as like a, f a fresh game <laughs> you know the deal making that that's an instinct that you just have um, did you not have the opportunity to kind of live that part before um I think I got to the point with retail and with the arts where I could see it wasn't a profession for me. Mm, mm -hmm. I wanted a I wanted a profession, and the great thing about the legal qualification for me is that it's a great discipline to have done. Mm -hmm. To it gives you a way of processing, a way of thinking, a way of looking at a problem, of analysing a problem. Um, and as I say, I'm not a terribly patient person. So, <laughs> you know, analyzing things isn't a great skill of mine. So no. I suppose it was a new layer of skill to mm. add on to the no. way I looked at the world. But yeah. I knew I wanted a prof profession and I knew I wanted to go out into the world and have a profession that would, um, you know, earn me a so certain amount of money, I suppose. I didn't want to struggle mm. working in retail and I absolutely love the arts. Um, but in the UK, people who work in the arts are not paid very much money. Mm. People who work in retail are not paid very much money. Mm. If you look at, you know, booksellers in the States, for instance, and other countries, it's considered a, a, a profession. Mm. In the UK, you know, it isn't. And I wanted, mm. a, I wanted a profession... Um, and uh, I suppose it was only when I started doing it that I realised that yeah, I had a bit of a, a bit of a flair for deal making, and I got excited. The you know the bigger the deal, the better, and yeah. um, that became something that um, that drove and, it, and excited me in my professional career. But at the same time, I didn't want to be a corporate lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I always and you know now more than ever given everything I've done and you know my, my, my age I suppose I will only do things that I'm passionate about and mm -hmm. so it's quite important for me I suppose to be uh, to, uh, at that early stage to be a lawyer in companies that I was passionate about where mm. I was proud of the output um, uh, and you know the, the, the content around the deals I was doing yeah so where did you go from there when um, y you said you went straight into TV production? Yeah, so I was um, very lucky that I got a head of business affairs job. Mm -hmm. So straight out of qualifying, um, so straight out of fili finishing my pupillage at the BBC, a um, company called Princess Productions, who now very, very sadly no longer exist, but... Princess was a company set up by Henrietta Conrad and Sebastian Scott. Uh, they had come out of Planet 24, um, The Big Breakfast. Um, Sebastian was an ex-TV presenter, um, incredible, creative, probably the best person, the best salesperson I have ever seen. Mm. So, you know, Sebastian pitching in a room was is just second to none. No. And what, what was it that made him so... I, I remarkable in in other companies i've worked at and i was talking to someone about this the other day um when you're selling tv shows we're se ultimately we're selling tv shows right you know we, you can't be too precious about it you're selling a commodity mm. um and sebastian i you know i've worked in companies where the idea is so precious to you mm. and you're so passionate about it that the idea that someone that you're pitching to doesn't like that idea is so alien to you mm. that you can become very defensive about it and it's yeah. like well what do they know you know i'll take mm. my idea somewhere else mm. sebastian had the amazing um ability to be able to mold his idea according to the reaction he was getting from a commissioner oh wow um mm -hmm. in a way that on know, the fly in yeah, the room on the exactly. spot there okay it's this and yeah. you could see the reaction he was getting was that's not quite right for us because we're more thinking that, well, actually, the idea is this <laughs> or the idea could be this. Um, but he was an incredible salesman mm -hmm. and he had, you know, a, 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 a good enough creative instinct and understanding of how a format is created and how it works mm -hmm. 
to be able to change his idea yeah. in the room. Um, uh, Henrietta was a great businesswoman, uh, had an incredible um, address book. Um, you know, I think we had we had Gwyneth Paltrow's phone kind of registered to Princess Productions at one point. You know, Gwyneth Paltrow and Madonna were amongst her friends. Wow. Um, so they came up with Late Lunch and Light Lunch, which was the first vehicle for Mel and Sue mm-hmm. on Channel 4. Um, so they were a uh, light entertainment company, mm. but they also had a, a, a talent um, company as well. Okay. So that talent company represented people like Vernon Kay and Steve Jones. Mm-hmm. Um, that was run by an amer- amazing head of talent called Emma Hardy, uh, who now works for, for Channel 4. But she just had this, you know, was able to spot talent very yeah. early on and grow talent. We also had um, an, a part of uh, part of the talent agency was New Comedians. Mm-hmm. We had Mackenzie Crook. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember, Gavin and Stacey Guy, Matt. I mm-hmm. can't remember his surname. Um, so, you know, they represented a lot of incredible talent. Yeah. Um, so I immediately had exposure to the talent business and TV production. I'd never done a TV commissioning agreement when <laughs> I got to Princess. Mm. Um, <laughs> I had been within BBC Resources where yeah. we were doing studio contracts, services yeah. contracts. Um, you know, so I had to walk straight in. Um, and negotiate deals with Channel 4 and the BBC, yeah. having never done it yeah. before. It's very interesting because the, the setup of that company sounds like uh, something that is kind of on vogue again, where production companies try to you know attach talent to themselves a little bit more permanently than just for one project. Mm. So it's quite remarkable that they've done that back, back then already. Um, yeah, but you know what? What I always say to people, I was talking to a production company recently who were talking about, you know, well maybe we'll start working with talent. It's incredibly labour intensive, mm. um, and you know, for ten or fifteen percent commission, which you're probably getting squeezed to these days, mm. it's very very hard work. No. Um, and as a as a talent agency, you own nothing. No. You know, you have a contract with someone which might be for a year or two years, but you can't hold someone to that contract. You know, yep. we, don't, you know we don't have legalized slavery in this country, so you, <laughs> you cannot hold someone <laughs> to a talent contract. Yep. And then you might be entitled to a little bit of commission you know, going forward on deals you've already done, yep. but you don't own anything. Mm. Uh, and that's the difficulty with, with, with talent agencies. You're not owning IP. And as we all know yep. now, you know, there was this incredible moment in 2004 when... The new terms of trade came in. The Communications Act brought in the new terms of trade. Yep. And companies like Princess, who I worked for then, and Wall to Wall, who I went to work for next, turned from being lifestyle businesses into proper IP-owning businesses that could be sold to US studios. You know, And mm-hmm. that was an incredible change in the industry, I think. So you just mentioned uh, Wall to Wall. Did you transition there in a different role or... Um, did you kind of pivot again in another direction? Yeah, so I suppose um, at Princess, I took over uh, business affairs, kind of commercial operations and distribution. Mm-hmm. Um, so I started going to MIP. We used distributors, mm-hmm. but actually we were doing a lot of deals ourselves. Mm. Um, you know, and things that are, you know, defining moments for you. you know, I remember turning up at my first MIP. I was completely on my own. It was just me. Yeah. I'd never been to MIP before. Yeah. No one had really told me very much about it. Yeah. You know, it's in I the south of France. It's beautiful. Know, You'll exactly. love it. You just walk up and down the corsette. Yeah. Um, you know, I had, a, I had a few meetings, but I didn't really know how it worked. And mm. I had a few contacts that I met up with. Um, but, you know, these are kind of terrifying moments in your career that you know, yeah. end up defining you and making you a better person. And yeah. you go back to MIP twice a year you're, yep. you know you start meeting up with people you have the contacts that you meet up with you get to know mm-hmm. how to do it um but i started doing kind of a lot quite a lot of the distribution for princess uh some of our commercial deals you know so much of what i learned about business i learned from uh henrietta um and actually uh, one of henrietta's close friends was 
a guy called Ben Silverman, mm -hmm. who at that point, um, I'm trying to remember, did he work for William Morris? I think he was an agent at William Morris. I think so. Yeah. Um, and then set up his own production company called yep. Reveille. Mm -hmm. So we did a lot of, we were doing deals. Uh, we were represented by William Morris in the States. So I was working with Ben to do deals. Yeah. Um, obviously, you learn quite a lot from someone like Ben Silverman in terms yeah. of how to do <laughs> deals. Yeah. Uh, and then I ended up having to do deals where Ben was on the other side of the table yeah. um, and I had to negotiate with Ben. Yeah. Um, so, you know, as I say, these are all kind of <laughs> defining moments yeah. and, and help you um, develop those really, really kind of key skills in, in, in negotiating uh, deals and, and TV deals and just existing in that world. So I, um, uh, there was an opportunity came up at Wall to Wall, which was, I believe it was commercial and legal director. Mm -hmm. It was in 2004 when the terms of trade had just changed. Uh, Wall to Wall was run by a guy called Alex Graham, who is a, a kind of a legend in the TV production industry and one of the very few people, I suppose, in television who... Um, at, at that time, I'm sure there are more of them now, um, who really, really believed in the creative, but also understood the value of what he was creating and wasn't embarrassed to say, mm -hmm. you know, I want to make money from this. And yeah. one day I want to sell my company because yeah. I've remortgaged my house three times over the last <laughs> 20 years. Yeah. I've built something <laughs> with value yeah. uh, and now I want to sell it. Um, and Alex was going on a journey whereby he needed to take wall to wall wall to wall had an incredible brand mm -hmm. an incredibly strong brand it always came up as number one in all the peer polls whether that was you know in international publications like real screen or um in you know uk publications like broadcast mm -hmm. as the most respected tv company in the world because their you know the creative bar was so high there um, but Alex knew with the terms of trade coming in that we were going to be, he could create real value. Yeah. And so we needed to turn wall to wall into a profit making company. Yeah. It wasn't enough just to have lots of big blue chip productions yeah. with a lot of revenue going through the company. They needed to be profit. Yeah. Um, so he bought me in and then I was followed by a new CFO called Stuart Mullen. Mm -hmm. Um, and we worked together to make, uh, wall to wall profitable. Yeah. Um, and ultimately we sold wall to wall to shed media. Mm -hmm. Was that the first role where you, you, you know, kind of extended the role to, you know, include more commercial duties and actually running the business? Cause obviously, uh, uh, w when you're kind of doing business affairs and the legal work, uh, often people aren't involved in shaping the future of mm. the company. They're actually just, you know, executing good agreements. Mm. Uh, was that the first one where you kind of got more involved in, in building a business? Uh, yeah, I mean, Walter Wall had more of um, an infrastructure in terms of a management team of which mm -hmm. I was part. So, you know, there was a, 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 a princess, it was, I suppose... It, at that stage of its evolution, um, Hen and Sebastian ran the company mm -hmm. and, you know, they, they kind of developed the strategy for the company and we, we yeah. followed. Um, so at Wall to Wall, Alex was a big believer in, you know, in having a proper board and having the senior members of the team contribute to mm -hmm. the future strategy of the company. Um, I set up a, a distribution arm. So we made a decision that we weren't going to give our rights to any distributors. Mm. We were going to keep everything. Yeah. Um, and so we set up a very lean and mean distribution <laughs> operation. Yeah. And so when we sold to Shed, we had a huge library of yeah. IP um, that we could then pass on to Shed's distribution company. Um, so, yes, I was working across the full gamut of, you know, rights in exploitation of those rights and mm -hmm. then rights out at, at, at the other end and we had some you know incredible ip to play with so uh during that time you know what so wall to wall was a very traditional blue chip documentary company mm -hmm. um and it had grown up making big big budgets co-production documentary co-productions um for you know channel four the bbc co-produced with Pro Sieben or Mediaset mm -hmm. and PBS, 
those big old complicated <laughs> factual co-productions, <laughs> yeah. which actually have now transferred into the scripted world. But in those yeah. days, you didn't do co-productions in scripted yeah. because all the territories wanted something different. And yeah. There was no such thing as this kind of high high concept scripted idea that could transcend um, geographic geographical boundaries. Yeah. And actually, those big blue chip documentaries tend not to exist in the co-pro world anymore. They became mm-hmm. a bit unfashionable. People just couldn't afford to spend that amount of money on on factual productions. But what we realized at Wall to Wall is that we needed more of a a mixed portfolio of programming. We needed some formats because none of this is is rocket science these days, but it was was the early days, it was the heydays Mm. of the formats. You know, it was the days (laughs) of the wife swaps and uh, the millionaires and, Mm. you know, these shows that we suddenly realized Terms of trade meant that we owned the IP, that we were going to keep 85% of it. Mm. Um, and you know, when the terms of trade were negotiated, part of that argument was around no one is going to sell these rights as hard as the producer is going yeah. to because yeah, that revenue is so much more material to the producer yeah. than it is to the BBC yeah. or ITV they or Channel 4. They don't really have an incentive for them there. You know, yeah. I, ITV, you know, the, the ad revenue is, you know, more interesting to yeah. them than, you know, the IP revenue, although, you know, it's probably arguable these days. Um, <laughs> I was about to say, I think that has changed, yeah. you know, it's like 180 degrees, but yeah, back no, in the day, sure. I mean, the, the broadcasts all made the bulk of the revenue with ad yeah. sales, so... Yeah. Uh, they they wouldn't spend the money to go out and you know pitch formats to it, other broadcasts. Not as hard or effectively <laughs> yeah. as we could. You yeah. know, no one sells a format like the like the producer does yeah. because they're passionate about it. Um, so we started diversifying the the, the productions that Waterwall produced, um, and you know so much of so much of success in TV production is. Not necessarily luck, but mm-hmm. it's you know zeitgeist. Mm-hmm. Can you can you come up with something that just hits the public imagination? Mm-hmm. Um, and Wall to Wall launched a show called Who Do You Think You Are, mm-hmm. uh, which when it was commissioned by the BBC was commissioned as a one-off series. The BBC was doing a season about what is Great Britain, who are who are Great Britons, mm-hmm. and so they commissioned ten parts about. Um, you know, the family history of celebrities. Yeah. Um, that show was a massive success, but it was not recommissioned for, I think it was nine or ten months wow. because it was mm-hmm. commissioned by Jane Root. She then left to go to Discovery. Um, and as we know about broadcasters, no one wants to commission someone else's show. They yeah. want to commission their own shows. Yeah. Um, but eventually uh, the new factual commissioner, I, I can't recall who it was, realised that they needed to bring back Who Do You Think You Are, that it was a great show. Um, I think they are now on season, must be 16, wow. 17. Yeah. Um, that's great. I mean, and, you know, that's, that's 15, so, 15 years later, still yeah. in production. It's quite rare that someone would, you know, make that perceived daring move to bring something like mm. that back uh, that wasn't there. Because mm. you're right, usually it's clean slate and yeah. you cannot take it to anyone else because, you know, you've introduced it there already. Mm. So, yeah. But doing, you know, doing history mm. on primetime TV in an entertaining way that can attract, you know, five to seven million viewers yeah. is difficult. So, you know, for, for, for a broadcaster like the BBC, who are supposed to be educating, you know, that's a, that's, that's a real tick. Yeah. straight away and just an incredible show um every time i watch it you know i've worked for water war for a long time but every time i watch it i'm just amazed by the stories that that, yeah. that they find it's an incredible show but but around that as well as selling the show internationally we we're able to do some incredible sponsorship deals mm-hmm. so we sold it to nbc um and we took with us um ancestry.com mm-hmm. So there was this incredible moment where Who Do You Think You Are went on air Mm -hmm. and Ancestry.com were investing millions and millions of dollars Mm -hmm. in digitising the National Archives in in the UK. And so as an individual, as a consumer, you could watch Who Do You Think You Are, be inspired by what you saw go online and start oh, like, doing your own family and, history. And when was this? This was, uh, this was 2004, 2004, oh. 2005. That's right at the forefront um, of, of that. I mean, yeah. 
this time around when broadband internet slowly started to spread. Uh, so quite advanced thing. I mean, nowadays that's, that's a standard promotional <laughs> thing to do, but back in the day, that, yeah. that must have been the first one of its kind, right? I mean, it wasn't really that, that kind of cross-pollination between a website and a TV program. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, but it, because it was a BBC show, we couldn't have um, uh, any. Um, oh, there was it wasn't no, advertised. It, 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 that no, it wasn't. Were, no, it's oh, just that what, okay. what, what, what Ancestry always told us though is as soon as we went online mm. in the show, people would go to Ancestry.com. Yeah. Even though we weren't producing the show with Ancestry.com, so they didn't pay any money. They didn't pay any money in the UK. No, oh, okay, no, okay. No, no, no. I thought they had been involved. Uh, but they were. So, but when so when we were, took the show abroad, we took to NBC. Mm. We were able to take Ancestry.com with us. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and you know, just did an incredible deal with Ancestry.com, and they are still sponsors today. Yeah. Um, so NBC took three seasons. In the states, it then went dis to Discovery, mm -hmm. um, and it's now just gone back to NBC. Okay. Uh, and Ancestry.com are still sponsors of it today. Um, so I think in the UK we did four or five book deals. We did a game. Um, we did a we did a digital app in the yeah. end actually in the UK. Um, but you know all around the world there were these incredible sponsorship commercial yeah. um, activities. But in the UK. When you're broadcasting on the BBC, you are hugely restricted, um, even more yeah, so in those yeah, days, yeah. around the commercial activities. So had that show been on ITV, mm. uh, <laughs> no we would problem. have made a lot more money than, than yeah. we made. Um, but yeah, that, that was part of diversifying Wall to Wall's portfolio, because you know in the UK, as you will know, in TV production, you are very defined within genres as mm -hmm. a TV producer. Yeah. So it, it meant that Wall to Wall was then seen by other broadcasters as a factual entertainment company mm -hmm. uh, and were able to move more into that space and, and diversify their portfolio. Uh, we then had a big scripted hit called New Tricks, mm -hmm. went on to do 12 seasons of that. Um, so we were able to take Wall to Wall to a place where not only did it have big revenue and big budgets, but it was also profitable yeah. um, and set it up very well to sell it to Shed Media. Yeah. So during all that time where you, you mentioned the formats uh, obviously being kind of a new thing, how did you personally navigate the process of, you know, uh, encountering new stuff, like new agreements, new types of agreements of kind of navigating the process of finding a good solution? Um, how did you, um, I don't know, educate yourself or find, like, how did you know what to do <laughs> in an environment where th there was no handbook? Part of the reason I left TV production in the end is because whether I was doing a deal with the BBC or with Netflix or Amazon, you're arguing over the same things. Mm. You know, these are all, sorry, not arguments, these are negotiations yeah. over rights. Yeah. And you might be talking about different pipes and different windows um, and different territorial breakdowns, but they are still basic rights negotiations mm -hmm. and you're weighing up risk and value. Um, and I think ultimately those deals rely on weighing up risk and value. Mm -hmm. um, and it never seemed terribly complicated to me. What was I mean? What was more, you know, what was more complicated is that everyone used different um, rights definitions. So every single broadcaster you dealt with used slightly different rights uh, uh, definitions from Nat Geo and Discovery and you know BBC etc. There's no, you know, there is no you know one single definition of what someone's particular service offering um, is defined as whether they're a cable operator or a you know, streaming service, blah, blah, blah. So, um, uh, you know, there's no single set of definitions which mm -hmm. would be helpful. Um, but I suppose it's just industry knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, we used to have, actually, when I was at Wall to Wall, we had a, a little group um, of heads of business affairs and commercial uh, who used to meet. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it'd be the head of 
business affairs for Tiger Aspect, mm-hmm. for Kudos, for um, Hattrick, you know, various other companies. And we yeah. would meet and people were very open about yeah. discussing the deals they were doing mm-hmm. um, because... Are we competitive? I suppose we, you, you know, you're competitive if you're tendering for a particular show, mm-hmm. but you're not necessarily head-on competitive in, yeah. the, in the TV production world. And so, you know, whilst protecting confidentiality, because they, you know, everyone was a everyone was a lawyer, and so they, you know, they were aware that they needed to protect confidentiality. People were reasonably open yeah. about the deals they were doing, the rights they were giving. Um, the windowing they were doing and so there was an exchange of information um, in a fairly open way and so I had uh, a network of people that I could go out to if if I didn't know the answer Mm. Um, and that was you know that was always useful and and valued and I suppose you know you should never underestimate the 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 value of your network in this this industry. I I think uh, you're spot on because Essentially, this industry is only people. Mm. It's, you know, it's the only thing there is. So mm. that, that's the, the personal, the only personal asset besides you know your expertise or your knowledge you can have mm. is the network. Uh, and and uh, as you said, you know, speaking with people regularly to you know see what's going on in the market because obviously you can read the trades mm. all day long, but <laughs> the, the juicy details are mm. often not in there or not with the same. Um, you know, gravity, I guess. Yeah. Uh, that... And I noticed actually when I moved into the digital media sector that it was different. Mm-hmm. Uh, and maybe it was just because I was, I had been less exposed and so I didn't have as deep a network, but people were less willing to share information mm-hmm. with you. Uh, and I think that has something to do with the the size of the market. It's much smaller in the UK mm-hmm. and the evolution it was a much a much earlier stage of evolution and so people hadn't quite realized that actually you were stronger if you shared information yeah. Yeah. people were much more protective of, of, of the kind of the deals they were doing and who they were doing deals with yeah. everyone was very quite secretive about that kind of thing where in the TV production we were pretty willing to share information with yeah. each other because in the end it actually benefits everyone and hurts no one no. Um, and of course, in the, in the UK, we were you know, very privileged and, and still are to have PACT. Yeah. Um, and so PACT uh, had and still have, I believe, a, a you know a business affairs advisory service. Yeah. So you could always ring them up. An excellent one, by the way. Mm. So shout out to PACT. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. No, it was, it, it, it's it, you know it's great, and you know PACT will be under pressure again because can the terms of trade survive Mm -hmm. the likes of Britbox and the streaming services etc or you know is that all going to be up for for renegotiation so I think you know PACT as the market constantly changes PACT will be called upon um, again. Now you mentioned you sold the company eventually um, to Shed which I believe was a a public company. Yes. Um, how, how How did that change your work or your personal role going from a private company to a public company and obviously different accountability, especially in the media space, I think it's always very tricky because uh, the market not, doesn't always understand how that industry really mm. works. Um, what, what did you notice how, uh, how things changed? Did they change? Um, I suppose for me at that time, because you were within one of the production companies rather than at group yeah. level, you saw less of that Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and you know that's almost one of the skills of working at group level which I you know realized when I started running Warner TV production that you're trying to protect the production companies in a way from all that kind of nonsense that they don't need to get involved in because you want (laughs) them focused on doing what they do you don't want them being diverted by you know admin or bureaucracy or any of that stuff and so I think when we first became part of the group um, we were probably protected Mm -hmm. um, from the machinations of AIM. (laughs) Um, It was only later on, I mean we stayed in our own offices Um, so we sold, I got to uh, wall to wall in 2004, we sold to Shed in 2007. Mm 
Um, I was promoted to be managing director of Wall to Wall. Yeah. Um, so I took on a, a slightly different role, took p &L responsibility, um, and then I took on the role as commercial director across all the shared production companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so I maintained the MD job at Wall to Wall and then took on commercial director role across all the production companies. Um, and at that time, it had become fashionable to uh, list on AIM. Mm -hmm. So Shed were on AIM, uh, RDF were on AIM, mm -hmm. Tinopolis were on AIM, um, and there were a couple of other companies on AIM as well. Um, and at first, it had been great, great <laughs> interest, lots yeah. of liquidity. Yeah. And then the st everyone's stock just died. There yeah. was just no liquidity. Mm. Um, you were a slave to your share price. Yeah. Um, you know, you're constantly trying, just trying to pay payments back on all the huge loans you had to do all the acquisitions. Yeah. And so you got into this cycle of reporting to the city, paying back the loans, yeah. share price not moving, not really having any cash in order to grow yeah. the companies. Um, and organic growth in TV production sector in the UK isn't easy. Yeah. Um, and so growing by acquisition yeah. is kind of the natural way to go. We didn't really have any cash to do that. We couldn't, you know, we were already pretty highly leveraged um, and we were getting no liquidity on AIM, yeah. which is why we made the decision to delist. Mm -hmm. um, and we could have either done that, I suppose, with... VC backing, mm -hmm. um, but we decided to go with a, 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 a strategic trade buyer yeah. like Warner Brothers mm -hmm. um, because they were a creative business and actually yeah. Warner's are, are one of the few studios who aren't also a network. Mm -hmm. um, and so they we saw them as a, as a creative partner, yeah. um, a company who would understand the creative process, mm. uh, you know, and understand how that works, um, the risks and rewards, yeah. I suppose. And I guess also the timelines, because my perception is always like media companies going public, there's just a huge misalignment of in expectations in terms of timelines from the market and the realities of, you know, media production and the exploitation of IP. Uh, it takes always way longer than you <laughs> anticipate. Mm. So an investor that doesn't you know, have that background, I think it's very difficult for them to absorb. Um, you know, I think that they, they might classify it as an excuse and it's like, ah, oh, you're just not working fast enough. Mm. <laughs> but, and you're like, no, this is this is how fast it is. Yeah. And you can't force it. Yeah, or, um, or understand where the value is, I suppose. Mm. You know, when I got when I got to Brave Bison, uh, and I'm, I'm sure we'll go on to that, but what was really important to me was for our shareholders to understand what we did. I was amazed yeah. when I first, you know, did my first round of shareholder meetings, how few of them really understood how mm. we made our money and what the revenue streams were and that they were invested in something that yeah. they didn't necessarily understand. So, yeah. you know, one of the things that was very important to me and that I prioritised was putting out information on our LinkedIn, doing interviews like this and putting them on LinkedIn so yeah. that our shareholders... Um, would understand what we did and which parts of what we did had value yeah. uh, and were going to move the dial. Yeah. You know, communicate when you're on AIM, communicating with your shareholders is, is absolutely key. Yeah. So um, when, when you took the company private again, how, how did that process work? Was that, I'm guessing, an incredibly stressful period or was this more of like, oh, we're going to be free, so to say again? Um, you know, and, and we have an investor or partner that understands it. And what was the, what was the driving force, I guess? It was, you know, I suppose there's always a, a, a bit of an unknown, isn't there? You mm. know, you're, you're, you're going into business with someone that they don't necessarily know you, you don't necessarily know them, mm. but, uh, you know, we looked upon it as a huge opportunity. We were going to be part of Time Warner. Mm -hmm. We were going to be sitting alongside HBO, Turner, CNN, you know, Warner Brothers TV production, yeah. Warner Brothers film, Warner Brothers animation, <laughs> um, you know, some of the biggest IP assets yeah. in the world. 
Um, a media knighthood. <laughs> you know, we used to walk around the studio. I remember walking around the, 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 um, the lot one day with my boss at that time, Nick Southgate, just saying, how did we end up here? You know, this is, this is amazing. Um, so it was, it was hugely exciting and a relief to be off AIM, mm -hmm. really. You know, it's incredibly expensive to be listed on AIM, takes up a lot of your time yeah. when you want to be out winning business and driving the business that you're you know spending time uh, on administrative things or on shareholder issues yeah. or on regulatory things um so it was um yes felt um you know felt exciting and a new chapter um enabling us to invest in new production companies to buy more companies to invest more uh, in particular genres that we wanted to invest in. Um, and obviously we had a number of, you know, the whole s system or evolution of buying TV production companies is that you have principles of those companies. At some point they want to exit those businesses. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we had the principle of wall to wall, of ricochet, of shared productions, um, you know, who are all going to exit the business at some point. So we needed to be planning for their succession, for investment in those companies uh, and for them to exit the companies as well. So, um, you know, it, it, it solved a number of issues and, and was a whole new exciting chapter. Yeah. Um, before we dive into kind of the next roles, one, one thing I always notice, and I guess it's also a, a big discussion everywhere now, is that there's still very... A uh, few uh, women in leadership positions uh, in, in this industry, but also others. How how did you experience that discrepancy, and I guess how did you navigate it uh, in in your career? Um, I think we're quite lucky in in TV production in the UK. I think there's an issue in the UK in that lots of or the majority of very senior creatives and executive producers tend to be men. And I think that is because lots of uh, being a series producer is, which is, you know, part of the route to becoming an executive producer is just a vicious business. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> it, it really is quite vicious. And if you've got children, you probably can't do it because when you're in production on something, yeah. you are in production and you are working very, very long hours uh, and you might be traveling, etc. So I think a lot of senior women creatives leave freelance careers and TV production at that point. Mm -hmm. um, lots of women tend to go into the production management side of things, yeah. um, uh, which I think is a shame because it means fewer of them on the creative side and then Potentially, that means that you're not getting a, a balance of ideas no. um, coming through. Um, but yeah, I was very, very lucky. Shed Productions was run by three women and a man. Uh, Princess Productions, who was my first company, was run, um, you know, fifty percent by Henrietta Conrad. Yeah. So I've always had a lot of female leaders in companies that I've worked for. Um, you know, I, I, I have to say that when I got to Warner Brothers, that was very different. Mm -hmm. It's a very male dominated company. Um, the three presidents of Warner TV when I worked there were all men. The CEO of Warner Brothers was a man in the UK. There was only one, um, one woman at EVP level, I think, who is a brilliant woman called Polly Cochran, who works in mm -hmm. marketing. Um, uh, and so I found this a much more male-dominated company. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think TV production in the UK generally is is quite female-driven, um, and so it wasn't a, a, an issue. It's very different in digital, which again yeah. is a very male-dominated business. I think because it, I guess because it uh, is associated with tech in some way. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, so, you know, I, I noticed when I moved into the digital world that that's quite male dominated as well. Now, speaking of that, was that the next step after Warner Brothers? Um, yes, so we sold Shed to Warner Brothers at the end of 2010. 
Um, we became fully acquired by Warner Brothers at the beginning of 2014. The, the CEO at the time, who was a guy called Nick Southgate, stepped down, uh, and myself and a guy called Nick Emerson stepped up to become co-CEOs of Warner Brothers. So they renamed um, Shed as uh, Warner Brothers Television Production UK, rolls off the tongue, <laughs> yeah. um, and Nick and I uh, ran that group of production companies until midway through 2017, mm-hmm. um, where we both stepped down. Yeah. And, uh, and the next role was Break Bicycle. Yeah, and uh, how, how, how did you get that gig, or how did you go from you know TV, because you spent so much time in TV, And then this was the digital business. Um, how, how did that come about? Were you looking for a change or were you approached? Uh... Um, a combination of the two. So um, I had been in TV production for 18, 19 years. Yeah. Um, we had achieved incredible things with Shed and we had sold it to you know a, a spectacular US studio. Mm. In working for Warner, I had met a lot of incredibly talented, clever people. I had been exposed to the US studio system and started getting, you know, an understanding of that and the way business was done and the kind of deals. Um, I could see the TV, the economics of TV production were changing. Mm-hmm. Um, we had been through this incredible fruitful period from 2004 to 2010 Mm -hmm. where it was all about the transfer of rights and value from broadcasters to independent tv production companies and everyone had sold their production company on the back of that value we were now all part of um you know highly aggregated um merged businesses um And the value chain was starting to move slightly. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot more work for hire happening. Mm -hmm. The Netflixes and Amazons of this world, they had come into the market. First of all, they came into the market paying big premiums in order to buy out rights. Um, Then as they started commissioning factual productions, They weren't paying those premiums Mm. as they became very powerful buyers in the market and everyone wanted to work for them. The the prices they were paying were reducing. Um, Their deals were looking less attractive. At the same time, broadcasters had realized that there'd been this big transfer of rights from the terms of trade. And so shows that were 100% funded were now 70% funded, 60% funded, Mm. scripted was 30% funded, but even factual shows were only 60-70% funded. So as a producer, you were having to invest your margin or your future IP revenue into the production of the show. Um, and it didn't look very rosy. Mm. There's, you know, a, 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 as as you will know, because of the the the, the um, you know the company you work for or or, or or own, there was a you know a renewal of interest in in scripted, mm-hmm. and scripted producers were cleaning up. Yeah. But the scripted world is a very very small world, mm. and you know there are about 10 scripted producers that are getting. 80% of the work. Yeah. There are about 20 writers who were getting 80% <laughs> of the work. Yeah. Um, and to me, the TV, the economics, I could see I could see the business model was changing slightly and I couldn't quite see where it was going or where I could be that would benefit from it. And so I didn't really feel challenged anymore by my role. Mm-hmm. Um, we weren't uh, necessarily actively involved in acquiring companies in the UK. Um, the business of running a super indie is that you know they're incredibly leaky vehicles. Mm. You have to keep <laughs> filling them up at the top because the value keeps yeah. leaking out because so much of the value is about individuals. Mm. Um, uh, we weren't acquiring companies. That wasn't our, our remit from Warner Brothers wasn't to yeah. acquire companies. Um, and so we were uh, you know, targeted with organic growth. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I didn't feel that 
my skills were necessarily best served in that role. Yeah. Um, I could also see that you know, the, the world of content was changing. Mm -hmm. There is content. There are these incredible consumer brands that yeah. you can create. Yeah. And there are pipes through which you can distribute content. The pipes you use depends on the audience you want to reach and the business purpose you want to serve. Mm. Why are you distributing that content? And I felt that TV production, particularly in the UK, was quite backward about looking at those pipes agnostically. Mm -hmm. We were quite focused on, well, we're producing TV content. TV content is premium and is the best. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, this digital thing is coming down the line, but we'll deal with it when we have to, but we're not <laughs> that interested. And so I felt that I wanted to expand my horizons into something other than just TV production. Yeah. I could also see the funding models were changing mm -hmm. and where the money was coming from was different. You, know, you had companies like Group M investing, yeah. you know, brands, media agencies investing yep. in production. And so I could see the landscape was changing. Um, and so I thought about setting up my own vehicle. But as I said, I couldn't quite see where the business model was going to end yet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, I, and I still can't. Yeah. Um, you know, I look at all these super indies and they start looking tiny yeah. next to the Googles and the Facebooks and yeah. the Apples and the Fox Disneys. And then you think, well, are you going to start getting a merger of the super indies, mm. in fact? And then, you know, in five years' time, will it all start fragmenting again? You'll go back to boutique operations. I can't quite see at the moment. Um, and so for me, Brave Bison was a combination of an entrepreneurial challenge. Mm -hmm. It was in turnaround mode. It was a company that had been in crisis had a, you know, a checkered history and needed to be turned around. So it was an entrepreneurial challenge, but it was an existing company. It was publicly listed. Uh, I've never been a CEO of a publicly listed company, so that was also a challenge. Yeah. Um, and I could either turn it, and someone said to me, you know, you're either, if you can turn it around, you're a genius, and if you can't, you know, whatever. But yeah. ultimately, I was able to turn it around. So. Yeah. And that makes me a genius, right? <laughs> <laughs> Someone said so, so it must be true. Um, I hope you got that in writing. Yeah, exactly. Oh, well, I've got it on the podcast now, so it's, it's, it's fact. It's public record now. Mm. Um, speaking of public record, how, how has that changed? Uh, you just mentioned it uh, from you know becoming a, a, a private citizen <laughs> to the officer of a public company. Uh, how, how did that change your life or the way you worked? Uh, the way you approach things, because um, obviously you need to be a lot more careful of what you say in public and so on. Um, how how old did you experience that? Um, you have a you know absolute responsibility to shareholders, and that weighs on you very heavily. Mm -hmm. um, you know we have you know it, going to see potential investors who are pension funds. You know, you're mm -hmm. sitting there thinking, well, people are investing, you know, their pension funds into a company that I'm running. You know, yeah. that is a heavy responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I like to think that I have quite a strong moral compass. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I, I always try to be transparent and honest in doing business. Mm -hmm. And when you're running a public company... Um, that is an important consideration to you. And so you have to put always first the best interests of the company and the, and the best interests of, of the shareholders. Um, and as a CEO of a public company, it's not like running your own startup mm. where it's, you know, it, it's about you. It, it was never about me. Mm. And I think that's difficult for some CEOs. And I, but I think it's partly because I'm, I've been a COO mm before and as a COO you don't take any glory for anything you don't have an ego you just go and get stuff done it's not about you and your successes you're making stuff happen and you're kind of in the background yeah. and so when I stepped up to that CEO role you do have to be a public figure mm -hmm. um, but it's also I kind of tried to balance that with it is about me because it's a public company and I need to be the face of that company yeah. But actually, it's not about me. I just happen um, to run it. I, I happen <laughs> to run it. And, you know, companies don't come up with good ideas. 
people do. It's about the people that run this company. I'm I am here to enable really good people to make a success of this company. I'm I'm here as an enabler. Um, and so yes, you're, you're right. It, it it does weigh heavily on you. You know, it it it's, it can become quite personal. No. You know, you have a lot of retail investors, and you know there are all these little chat rooms where people talk about. Uh, you know, investors are talking about shares, uh, and they refer to you very, very personally. Mm. You know, any, any time the share price moves, it's no. you know, Hungate's done this, or Hungate's done that, or you get your bonus. Well, Hungate's pocketed this, um, <laughs> uh, and, and it's all on you. Yeah. And when yeah. and when the share price goes up and you're successful, it's like we love Hungate. Mm. When it goes down, it's you know, mm. what's she done? Oh. Um, uh, so you know, it it can become quite personal. So you've got to ensure that you are running the company in the best interests of the company, yeah. uh, not worrying too much about the share price because you hope that eventually the share price will you know, find a, find a position that values the company um, according to the results that, that you are delivering. Yeah. How in, so in, in those circumstances, how did you like personally kind of disconnect, wind down, relax, because I'm, this is omnipresent in your life. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, you, you read some comments about yourself where you're like, oh my God, they don't understand the first thing about A, who, am, who I am and the company. How, how do you manage to not let that affect you, you know, when you leave the office, so to say? Um, I mean, I, I, do you have a recipe? Yeah, and I mean, I never really let the personal comments affect me. You know, it's like it's the same about management. You know, everyone's always looking for a, a target, aren't they? You know, mm. one of the most difficult things you have to do as a manager is is manage your staff. You know, you can't keep all the people happy all the time. Mm. You just have to accept that um, and believe that what you're doing is is right. You know, I always said to people at the business, I will. Absolutely, I think on day one, I stood up in front of staff and said, "I'm absolutely someone who will take your views into consideration, and I want you to help us develop the strategy for this company. But it's not a cooperative, and ultimately, I'll make decisions that you don't like sometimes, no. um, and that's because this is where the buck stops. And so, no. you know, I absolutely take on board your opinions, but sometimes we won't agree, and I'll have to make." decisions and you can't take any of that personally you just have to understand that yeah. you can't please all the people um but i i go to the gym a lot um <laughs> you know it might it might not show uh but i love going to the gym and i have done for, for three or four years it's mm. a bit of an obsession yeah. um and so four or five times a week i oh, go to okay. the gym and that's that's my relaxation yeah. um I have a couple of very small children who you met earlier yeah. um, and, you know, they will take your mind off work because yeah. that's, that's a 24 hour. Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a question as a father that I'm asking myself because, uh, um, you know, it's something that happens to me uh, <laughs> that I, you know, I'll, I'll play with my son and then I start thinking about something at work and I, I try to like almost like a meditative exercise, mm. not think of that. Mm. So I'm always wondering what other people do, what their mm. recipe is in, in, you know, shifting the focus in those moments. because I mean, that's the time mm. that matters. It, it, it's yes, it's difficult. You know, I try never to be on my mobile phone, mm. um, when I'm playing with the boys. And if I ever am, they will actually stop pulling it out of my hand, <laughs> or pulling my hand and trying to get me to, you know, do something yeah. you know, to play with them. Um, but, you know, we're pretty strict about when we're with them, we are mm. present with them and we are playing with them. I will never yeah. sit at, I will never sit at the dinner table and be on the phone. Yeah. Um, you know, I will always try to keep away from the phone. But, you know, it's, it's inevitable when you're, when you're doing a job that, it will leak into your private life a little bit, yeah. but you know they're um, the boys are pretty compelling and uh, pretty hard work. So yeah. uh, sometimes there isn't room for, for both things. Yeah, I mean, I think it's always about uh, you know making a conscious effort, regardless of what you do. I mean, mm. in, you mentioned the gym; that's the same there. Mm. Uh, you know, you're not going to have a great workout unless you're 100 percent there. Mm. You're not going to have a good uh, meeting with colleagues if you're not 100 percent mm. there. Uh, so yeah, it's 
I, I think that's uh, the only way really to you know, make sure that you can deliver your best. Uh, so how would you say as um, would you would you want to do this again being the officer of a public company uh, or you know are you like oh no been there done that that's nice but uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll work for a private equity funded company or or you know VC do you know what? Funded I, company. I, I loved going out to shareholders mm -hmm. I loved going out uh, and talking to shareholders uh, I think if you are passionate about what you do and you really believe in the product or the service that you are offering and that you have a, a vision for that company that you really believe in, then being on the front line in front of shareholders, whether they're existing shareholders or potential new shareholders, is one of the most exciting things you can do. Um, and so, uh, I, you know, I don't have any particular objection to running a public company. In fact, I quite liked it. Mm -hmm. uh, I quite like that element of the business. Um, uh, you know, I think, you know, running a, an, 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 another ailing, aimlessly company and doing mm. another turnaround. Yeah. Uh, maybe not, again, unless it was something that I was <laughs> so passionate about. Yeah. And I could see with Brave Bison... I could kind of see what had gone wrong historically and mm -hmm. I knew I could fix it. Yeah. Um, uh, and that was what was exciting to me about that. But um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have an issue with running a, a public company mm -hmm. going forward. Although, you know, as we've discussed, there are there are pressures, but, you know, as, as you will know, there are also pressures of having private funding or, yeah. or, or um, you know, VCs on your back as well. Yeah. So in all, all these years... Uh, and this might be more of a management question, I, I guess. Um, did you feel like there's um, certain KPIs or you know developments in the company that people obsess with that you think are you know uh, not as important to watch as something else that people might be um, you know not focusing on? Um, there's a, a really interesting. TED talk by a woman called Margaret Heffernan um, about this theory of the super chickens. Mm -hmm. um, it's worth looking up. And she talks about, uh, it was a, a, a study that someone did where they put a bunch of super chickens together mm -hmm. and then just a bunch of, kind of normal chickens. And within a period of time, the super chickens have pecked each other to death and they were all dead. Oh. Uh, and so she transfers that into the workplace to say mm -hmm. that this idea of having, you know, some star performers to have a very competitive atmosphere where you have some star performers that are, you know, vying for position isn't healthy. And actually, it's much more healthy to have a really high level of social networking and social cohesion, people collaborating and working mm. together. Um, and that's what creates success within companies. And I think there's a, you know, a lot to be, a lot to be said for that. Um, so I have always encouraged one of the things that I worked a lot on at Brave Bison was ensuring that everyone understood the company's strategy. Mm -hmm. Everyone bought into the company's strategy and everyone understood their place within that strategy and what they were trying to achieve. Um, and understood what their colleagues were doing as well mm -hmm. and therefore could contribute if they had some knowledge or they were working on a deal that, you know, kind of crossed, that they would work together and mm -hmm. that they would feel that they wouldn't feel that they had to keep that deal to themselves because they were commissioned on it or something, mm -hmm. that it was, you know, something that we could open up to more voices, more heads and potentially make into a, you know, bigger, more interesting deal. Um, so yes, I'm not a big believer in creating the super chickens within a company. <laughs> I'm a big believer in in collaboration and, 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 and cohesion and people talking to each other and, and working together. No. And the, I mean, the other thing that people always talk about is, is authentic leadership. Um, uh, and I think, you know, sometimes I think what's really important for people to accept is that sometimes as a CEO, you don't feel like being a leader. Mm. And that you walk into the office every day and if you were being authentic, you would 
you know, sit there and wouldn't be very much fun for anyone to talk to. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes as a CEO, you cannot be authentic. Mm. You have to walk into that room and you have to put on the face mm. um, because you have to, you know, you can't sit there and say, oh, well, do you know what, actually today, no, I'm feeling really down about the business. Or feeling, that doesn't work. You have got, you know, 80, 100 people staring at you yeah. and they are looking to be inspired and motivated by yeah. you and for you to come up with solutions. Yeah. And so this idea of authentic leadership, although I believe in it from the point of view of, of being yourself, yeah. um, sometimes you have to act that role. Yeah. Um, and you know that that, that that's something that that you, that you learn. You don't always feel like walking in and standing up in front of everyone doing the rah rah speech, mm. but you have to do it. Yeah. Speaking of learning, if you had a chance to meet twenty year old Claire uh, today, what were some what would be some of the things you would tell her? Um, be much better at networking <laughs> earlier on. Mm. You know the power of your network. And uh, it is so. It is the most important thing. You know, we did a, a an event at, um, on International Women's Day for the women within Brave Bison, and that you know that was the thing I was trying to get across to everyone that you know LinkedIn isn't about getting a job. It's about creating a network. Mm. I remember speaking to a headhunter a couple of years ago who said to me, "Men are always in touch with me." Whether they're looking for a job or not, mm. they are always in touch with me. Women are only ever in touch with me if they're looking for a job. Mm. Um, and so what I would say to everyone, and women particularly, is don't be scared about networking. Mm. Networking is a two-way thing. Someone will only network with you if they're getting something out of it themselves. Yeah. Um, and so if they don't want to meet with you or have a coffee with you, then you know they won't respond to you. But don't be scared about reaching out to people. Your network is where you are going to find most of your support and most of your opportunities in your career, particularly within uh, media. No. And I don't think I appreciated that early enough mm. in my career. Um, so I, you know, I would say that to people from from very early on. It's what I always say to people who, you know, contact me and say they're looking for a career in media. Is get out there and meet people. Yeah. No. Now, obviously, we spoke a lot about the past. Uh, still want to talk to you about the future. What's what's uh, what's next for you? Um, I you know I've got a couple of passion projects mm -hmm. that I'm uh, looking at at the moment. Um, I have a couple of advisory roles that I'm going to take up. Um, potential non-exec director positions, um, but I'm you know really really open to to what's next. No, yeah. actually, um, I'm in no particular hurry. Um, as I said near the beginning of this, I will only do things now that I'm very very passionate about, that I really believe in. Yeah. Um, and that challenge me and excite me in yeah. some way. You know, when I moved in from TV production to digital, you know, I was out of my comfort zone mm -hmm. most of the time for the first, you know, six months or so. <laughs> um, uh, and, and that's quite fun. You know, it's yeah. fun learning something new. It's fun learning new business models, you know, new clients. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in learning new things. I'm interested mm -hmm. in new challenges. Uh, but I also will only do something where I'm bringing value mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Um, and that's always really important to me when I'm looking at non-exec director roles. Uh, I want to get something out of it. They want to get something out of it. There has to be a value um, exchange. Yeah. Um, and they have to want me to be there as well. Yeah. So, so what are some of the things on your wish list? If, if you could write them down, they would come true like 100%. Uh, is there something specific on there? Like a, another industry you you're interested in or you know you mentioned the things you know you need to be passionate about it um are there some things on your list already uh there are but you know i couldn't i couldn't possibly tell you <laughs> okay well um i think that's the perfect place to wrap it up uh, thank you so much for your time thanks uh, it's been really good fun i appreciate it and uh, yeah thank you for all the insights and i'm looking forward to speaking to you next time about the future that we just talked about Absolutely. Watch this space. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening, everyone. We'd love to hear from you now. Please let us know what you think of the show and this episode. Leave us a comment, send us a message or tweet. And we're looking forward to welcoming you on our next episode. 
By the way, you can follow Media CFO on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. And if you haven't already, please subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcasts and rate and review this podcast. Again, thank you for listening and bye-bye. The Media CFO podcast is hosted by Tobias Sieger. Our executive producer is Bridget Scar. Digital editing by Christina Vogt and Antanasios Karakantas. Designed by Daniel Cottis. Many thanks to Anouk van Gemen and Frederick Jäger for their creative review. The notes for the show can be found on www.themediacfo.com. Copyright 2019, Colibri Studios.